consider this story. A teacher by the name of Helen Morosmo tells an individual story of an entire class of students who were having a particularly difficult time mastering a new and complicated concept in math. By the end of the week, the students were growing frustrated with themselves and with one another. And the teacher had a choice. Either she could respond to the students out of her own sense of anger, venting her own frustrations as a teacher dealing with irritable students, or she could respond as one visage of God to the other, practicing the principle of our creation. Sister Morosla chose the lab. She stopped her lesson and asked her students to take out a piece of paper and to list the names of the other students in the room and to leave a space between each. She then instructed them to think of the very nicest thing they could say about each other and to write it down. And at the end of the class, she collected the papers. When the class returned on Monday, the sister handed to each student a new piece of paper with all the comments that their classmates had made about them compiled on their own personal sheet. Before long, the entire class was smiling. No one ever mentioned those papers in class again, but the students were happy with themselves, with one another. They would go on to graduate and begin their individual lives. And it would be several years later that most of them, their teacher included, would gather together again. Unfortunately, it was for the funeral of one of their classmates killed in Vietnam. After the funeral, the parents of the soldier who had died approached the sister and said, we want to show you something. Opening a billfold, they carefully removed a sheet of worn notebook paper that had obviously been taped and tore, folded and refolded many times. The sister knew without looking what it was. They found the son Mark when he was killed, said his father. As you can see, Mark treasured. Mark's classmates started to gather around. One smiled and said, I still have my list. It's in the top drawer of my desk at home. Another said, mine's in my wedding album. Another, mine's in my diary. And yet another reached into her purse and then showed her own worn and tattered list to the group. See, what started as a response to a class of frustrated teenagers had such a significant and lasting impact on them all. Each of these students remembered how they were treated and valued. Each remembered extending the same. Each of these students treasured the moment and how it felt to be seen in the image of God. Imagine how this one singular response must have continued to affect the way that each of them, now adults, would respond to the divine in others throughout their days. How much good could we accomplish if we continually said to ourselves that the person across from me is worth just as much as every other human being, not more because of what he did for me, not less because of what he did to me, but every bit as much as me because he is a creation of God, another human being bearing the spirit of Adonai. How much more could we contribute if we first recognize our kinship, our commonality with one another, before any other consideration? How much more would we temper our responses and curb our inclinations? Think. Never to qualify another by their profession, their age, their dress, their partner, the color of their hair, the temple they associate with, the music they listen to, or the car that they drive. No longer to build our opinions or set our expectations upon assumptions rather than on a person's innate soul. 
bring you one last story. It's relayed by Leo the Scholar. It's a story that has remained within my heart ever since first hearing it some 15 or so years ago. It's a story of a time when he had once found himself standing in line. And there were several people in front of him and the woman behind the counter was treating the customer in turn with growing anger and impatience. While those in front of him finished their business, he had a little time to decide how he would react when the turn was his to stand before the clerk. Approaching the counter, he handed the woman his paperwork and she briskly took it. Excuse me, he said, but I couldn't help but notice you're having a really hard day, aren't you? As his question sunk in, the furrows between her eyes began to soften and she actually began to cry. It had been an exceptionally hard day, and she was at her limit. Thank you, she said, collecting herself. Thank you for caring. With that, it seemed as if a great and terrible burden had been lifted from her heart. Scalia, like those in the line before him, could have just seen a nasty old clerk behind the counter. An ill-mannered, short-tempered, nasty old clerk. And he could have reacted in kind. And I'm sure many of us have found ourselves in similar situations. But instead, he saw a child of God a creation of God's spirit, which allowed him to see a child of God in pain, which moved him to lighten her load, which caused him to lighten the experience of those behind him, which caused an endless chain of positive reactions, all from one simple recognition. As we read today, we are all of us here for Adonai our God. But I would suggest to you, not as water drawers and chieftains, as we will be, as drawers and chieftains, not as elderly and young, but as human beings, equally pregnant with the Spirit of God. And I must admit, as I did before, we are something to behold. My friends, if over the past year or past many years you have forgotten what the Spirit of God looks like, take a peek next to you. And then this afternoon or this evening, take a good long look. Watch your kids tonight. Or pull out their pictures from long ago. Move your loved one's face around a little bit if you need to. But find God's face because it's right there. And because conditioning ourselves to see the image of God first puts the power of the miraculous into our very own hands. This year, may it be our blessing to choose to seek the Spirit of God to live our lives in the light of God's presence.